This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Uh, it's been a while since we've recorded an episode. Well, not totally true. We did do the swap cast to talk about the trips. Uh, we're going to do a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of that today as well before we get back into the main topic. Uh, but we, we do have Randall, myself, and Kyle. Got Brad here. Got Normality Anchor Mike with us. And also Laura, who is our social media manager. She's hanging out. Uh, so we're going to have a good show. And uh, yeah, Randall. So, did you want to talk? Did you want to look at the Scabland stuff first, or the most recent trip you guys did? Oh well, uh, might as well do the Scablands because that was the first trip we did. Okay. And uh, Alex uh, Flavor, you want to tell a little bit about Alex who put this together? Yeah. So Alex, uh, he he's on multiple podcasts. He's good friends with the guys from Grimerica. We know him very well because he's in our uh, he's in the Discord chat for our podcast. And Darren had asked him to come on the Canyonlands trip we did with Matheson to do videography and basically document the trip and make a documentary out of it. And then also we got him to come to the Scablands one and he did the same thing because he did such a great job before. Uh, but yeah, he's got a good eye. He does good interviews. And uh, so yeah, he's been putting together all the material. And I think he has a, uh, what is it, like a like a preview of the full yeah, thing? Yeah, like a little synopsis. I haven't seen it. Yeah, synopsis. Uh, yeah, so I did it twice, and it's it's got the kick ass soundtrack. Some one hit wonder, I guess. I don't remember who, <laughs> <laughs> who the uh, who did the soundtrack, but yeah, but right. I just wanted to mention, just in case that we did watch that video that Alex put together, I made I wore the same shirt that I ah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to prove that it was actually you. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if anyone doubted that that was actually me, you can tell that it's me because I've got the same shirt on. <laughs> but I have the megaphone here. <laughs> so uh, did any of us queue up the video? I did not because I don't have it. <laughs> oh. I was yeah. expecting uh, producer Brad to do that. Yeah, is producer Brad going to do it? The other thing, we, ha you know, we haven't done this in a while, and I just noticed you don't have your headphones on. Randall, <laughs> we must be coming out of your speakers. You are. He's got speakers working. Loud yeah, and on clear, the, uh, let me tell you. It's on the other computer. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I, I, I need guys. to switch. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, because when if if someone was talking, you I could heard your audio ducking out. Yeah. Okay, we Which don't want that, do we? Yeah. So. Oh, we want you loud and clear. Um, okay. All right. Okay. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> After we Commercial fix break. technical difficulties. No, don't go away. Don't go away. Let's see. So yeah, anybody can get it. It's on HowTube. So it's uh, howtube.com slash uh, 11106. Right, we'll you want pull us it to pull it up? We'll pull it up then. Yeah. Let's see. You get the number memorized and everything? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like that. <laughs> that almost slipped by me. You guys are in the headphones now. All right, good. There it is. Contact the Cataracts, May 21 Highlights. Oh, you found it, I think. Yeah, I just had it right here, too, I think, right on, almost on my fingertips. Yeah, we're pulling it up. Okay, all right. Oh, Brad, look at Brad. We're in a snake breath. Okay. Brad yeah, it starts quick, shirt. so you got to have it. Uh, yeah, he needs up to add there. a little bit of blank time, a few seconds of blank time right at the beginning, but I guess it's not, it's still a work in progress. Yeah, all right, we're going to share it real quick here. Yeah, crank up your volume. Do you need me to crank up that volume for the for the video? Just click share. Well, whatever. I mean, this is a well, you know, for I'm the rock and soundtrack, man. Got to have some volume. It. I'm going to inject it in here. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, this can be here so that people know that who's in charge around here.
Now, tell me about the moon. <laughs> it's over there, moon. <laughs> That's genius. That was terrific. That was really great. <laughs> I never, I never uh, thought of those lyrics in that way, but yeah. wow, it really makes. Yeah, Alex took the word seriously. <laughs> That's great. Which made, which fit perfectly. Loved it. Yeah. Well, it was certainly a lot of fun. Yeah, it was it a lot sure of fun. Was. So yeah, we're going again, September twentieth to twenty sixth. Sign up now. You may be too late already. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, this and this the the September one will be even better than the uh, the May one. That's right. That's right. We're, we're, getting, we're getting better at you it. Added we're an getting extra better. Day. Extra we'll day. have an extra day. Yep. We'll have a better food situation. Which yep. uh, probably be hotter. Have, hey, yeah. I have an idea. They're fantastic. They're just huh? amazing. Get them to bring a covered wagon, and then we'll we'll go up to Northrop Canyon, and we'll catch us as about fifty rattlesnakes. <laughs> we'll come back and we'll have a rattlesnake cookout. <laughs> All right. I want to try some jackalope chops. Yeah, jackalope chops. <laughs> well, there we go. Perfect compliment. Do we need the covered wagon to get the snakes? No, but to get for the for the ambiance. Okay. <laughs> okay. We need the wagon so we can circle the wagons, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, actually, I, I think I must have explained it that way because I, it, even as I was saying it, I was having a little bit of a flashback to when I was nine years old. With Back my uncle Sam, who was a herpetologist. Circle. A what? A herpetologist. Uncle Sam. My yeah, uncle Sam. I had an uncle <laughs> Sam. He was a six foot Sam Wheeler. He was six foot six Texan. And he was a herpetologist. You know what a herpetologist is? I don't. Cap oh. Snakes. Snakes. Yeah. Kyle. Snakes uh, reptile lizard. wrangler. Reptile wrangler, yeah. So I went on snake hunts with him when I was a kid. And that was a lot of fun. And one of the ones we went on out in West Texas somewhere was uh, some kind of a roundup. And they had uh, a bunch of covered wagons there. And they were doing a big cookout. And I went out with my uncle. And we come back with a couple of gunny sacks full of rattlesnakes. And uh, the chef there, he he cooked them up. And uh, <laughs> tasted a lot like chicken. <laughs> It's so my, this comes from experience. From, this isn't a fantasy. This no, no, a, that really happened. There. That really happened. I had an uncle Sam. Oh, he wow. was he was six foot six, and until I was like five or six years old, I didn't differentiate between you know the uh, the nickname for for America, Uncle Sam, and my uncle Sam. So whenever the Uncle Sam came up on television or in discussion or whatever, I was that's my uncle. I didn't know that my uncle Sam was different, but then when I finally met my uncle, I'm thinking he does not look like the uncle guy Sam. in the striped suit with the long white skinny beard, and because he he was a big he was a big he was a colossus of a man, six foot six, six foot seven. But yeah, I had some great experiences going out with him as a kid, and that was one of the reasons I think I got interested in reptiles. And for a couple of years, and when I was living in Backwoods, Louisiana, I had my own little reptile farm, courtesy of Uncle Sam, who would supply me with a lot of different kinds of lizards and turtles and snakes. And I had wire pens, cages in my backyard there in the woods in outside of Pineville, Louisiana. Well, that explains a lot. And here you are doing a podcast with the Brothers of the Serpent. <laughs> yeah, I know. You got yeah. us in a cage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Full Everything circle. comes full circle. <laughs> but you yeah, know why? Uh, you know why snakes taste like chicken, right? I mean, snakes and birds—they kind of, you know, they used to be relatives. one in the same. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, they used to be relatives, didn't they? Yeah. Well, dinosaurs. But then what? Like, snakes. Uh, snakes. Lo yeah, what dinosaurs happened? were they grew like legs and wings, and dinosaurs into birds. were like snake birds. Snake snickens. birds. They were snake birds. Yeah, snickens. Oh, okay, oh, right. Okay, right, right. And, and then they they diverged after the after the KT impact, and now we have chickens and snakes. And they were first cousins to chakes. <laughs> That's right. Chakes and snickens. That's the reciprocal cross. But yeah. Yes, you're right. Yeah. 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 So I had uh, I had a bow constrictor at one time. I had multiple hog nose snakes. I had a king oh, no. snake, red and red and black. You guys know how to tell the difference between a king snake, a banded king snake, 
and a coral snake, don't you? Black on red, friend of Fred. <laughs> well, that's a little different than the one I know. <laughs> <laughs> the other one is the other way around. Black on yellow, kill a fellow? Yeah, red, black oh. and... Uh, now, see, you've got me confused. Or is it red on yellow? <laughs> black and I don't know yellow. How to tell the difference. Black and yellow, kill a fellow. There it is. Yeah. Well, uh, black no. Red, friend of Fred. Oh, no, no. V- red and black, venom lack. Oh, there you go. Venom, I mean, red and yellow, kill a fellow. Okay. You are thoroughly confusing everyone at this point. <laughs> don't Isn't take my snake advice. to help you remember? <laughs> well, if you're out, I mean, like, I don't know about, well, here in Georgia, we have coral snakes and king snakes. Yeah. Yeah, we have them too. Best bet is just to stay away from all of them. <laughs> Trust me. No, but king Danger snakes are noodles. Cool. They make cool pets. <laughs> I thought so anyway. I had some king snakes. And then at one time I had two black water snakes. Big old one was a male and a female. The female was six feet long and the male was seven feet long. And they were about the size, the male anyway, it's about the size of my forearm. Nice. And I had them in a big old aquarium and I come home from school one day. When you were nine though. When I was nine. Yeah. The nine year old forearm, not your current forearm. (laughs) No, my current forearm. No. Yes. A seven, you don't think a seven foot snake would have well, maybe my forearms are big, but I don't know. Yeah, no, that thing was this big around. <laughs> I'm saying a- your forearms were the same size now as when you were nine? <laughs> yeah, it no, looked Popeye. like Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had Popeye arms. <laughs> no, Laura, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the damn water snakes were about the size of my present day forearms, okay? <laughs> they were fat. Look, you don't have a seven foot snake that's only an inch in diameter. Well, never mind. Especially when you just <laughs> fed them pieces of your seven-year-old friend or something like that, right? That then they'd be really fat. People if you don't what? like. If you fed them somebody you didn't like, they'd be really fat. Then they'd be really fat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I would just feed them. You know, we had several <laughs> cats that disappeared mysteriously <laughs> under you mysterious see, circumstances, see, and I did notice some <laughs> unsightly bulges. <laughs> yeah. <in> the- <laughs> You no, that's the part types of, of situations I, I we made, get ourselves I, into here. I made up that part. I made up that part. But this, <laughs> listen, this you really never, did happen. I come home from school one day, and I don't remember how how it was, but I went to feed them, and they weren't in their aquarium. And I thought, oh shit! Of course, I maybe didn't say shit because I was only nine years old. But so I went looking for them, looking, couldn't find them, and finally I looked in my under my mother's bed, and they'd both crawled under my mother's bed and i was saying shit i got to get those snakes out of there before she gets home from work so i I tried to get them out couldn't get them out i finally had to crawl under there and try to wrestle them out and how i got them out was they both i got bitten probably 20 times and how i got them out was they both bit me and were hanging on to me so i was able to (laughs) crawl out with the snakes (laughs) with their jaws into my flesh (laughs) <laughs> so and that's, that's, that's a, utterly familiar to the start of the podcast well it's a true story and and it's <laughs> i wouldn't be you got to understand things like the episodes like that to understand the man that i am today <laughs> so but that really did happen and i don't remember how i guess i pried them loose and got them back in the into the uh, aquarium before my mom got home but but yeah, I had little, I had pock marks all over my arms and stuff where they had been biting me trying. To, and I think after that, I told my uncle to come get the, get the snakes. Cause they, I didn't have them long after that. But, um, yeah, I mean, having an uncle who was our her- herpetologist definitely was a, uh, was an inspiration to me as a little kid. Randall had a farm subsidized by uncle Sam. Folks. <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you didn't eat them. No, didn't gave them back to Uncle Sam. Okay, gave them back to Uncle Sam, but did eat those rattlesnakes. A bit of field of our wagons and (laughs) having a cookout with snakes didn't. Yeah, so let's let's hear about the Arizona trip. Well, the Arizona trip. Well, um, how can we? uh, (laughs) Hey, okay, do we have? There was 40, there was 40 people at the Scablands. You know, we had three vans full of people and three or four cars tagging along. We had this huge caravan. So then in Arizona, it was just one van ah. and, and a couple of support vehicles. So yeah, it was a, it was a different experience, but places were just as awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
but yeah, it, uh, it went by too fast as usual. So what, yeah, there's, there's kind of a, there's kind of a summary video on that too, but I haven't even, uh, I don't know where that one is. If that's what you were, what you were about to say. Oh, I've got it. I've got it. Let's see. Um, and then, yeah, that's just kind of a first version. It doesn't even cover all the places we went, but yeah, we, we spent two days in Moab. So we are right there at uh, Canyonlands national park and, uh, arches national park. Um, so those were two incredible days consecutively. And then there's arches outside of the park itself. So we found a couple of those when hiking up to them. Uh, and then two days in Mexican hat, which is right uh, outside monument Valley there at the Arizona, Utah border. Um, went to a couple different sites where we uh, took people six months ago when you guys were with us. Um, didn't go to goosenecks, but we went to the overlook of the goosenecks, went up the Moki Dugway and, uh, checked out the long distance views to the San Juan river down there and the monument Valley, whatever, 20 miles out on the horizon. Uh, that was pretty spectacular, but it was super windy that day. So there was not yeah. any drone flying or sunbathing. You know, we were, we were kind of huddled up. It was cool. Yeah. Uh, I did find the, uh, the video and I think Robert Dakota put this together. I'm not a hundred percent. Okay. Let's see if I can, uh, let me. Yeah, so fortunately, we got people that are collecting everybody's media, and then people have agreed to share everything. So then it's getting pared down and uh, put into these cool little summaries. Right. And they expected that they'll be uh, assembled into like a virtual tour. So, so people can, you know, pay a fee and go along by way of the video and hear some of Randall's lectures along the way and, uh, you know, get the coolest shots from the drones and the, uh, the campfires and you know whatever was going on we had a we had quite a big time out there with with the group of 16 yes we did it was uh, a lot of fun okay now i think i got it here Man, that's cool. Yeah, Where, but th that? it's only really half finished because some of the best stuff in Arches and Canyonlands, Dead Horse Point, Muley Point isn't even in there yet. That's so right. this is just a total, the first half of it. Right? Is that your drone work? Nope. No? I who's hadn't who's contributed was that? anything to them there. Well, the uh, uh, woman that came along with us that does some organizing and manages a lot of the food, uh, does a bunch of the photography, Yuko. So yeah, she's got a drone. Nice drone work. I thought it was yours. I did fly it there in Valley of the Gods, but uh, yeah, not so often because there were three people in the Scablands that were flying drones, and then and then two or three people down there in the Southwest also. But yeah, look good. Like and Randall said, it that's not even at the big parks out mm -hmm. of Moab. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's gonna well, what it says just a teaser. Yeah. But yeah, yep. we'll be doing one of those again. Uh, sure there's will. still a lot of sites we hadn't sit, uh, hit in that in that region too. But that yeah, one's more uh, more Pueblo ruins oriented. 
That's kind of yeah. half and half. Definitely want to get to the next one. Sad, I missed that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys were missed. Yeah, it would have been fun to be there, but we had to get back to work. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, so... Um, so we're having fun out there, so that's our excuse for uh, not recording and not publishing and... Yep. There's lots of stuff happening still, but uh, yeah, we've been pumping it out for months. So uh, we took a month off after getting uh, things postponed, postponed in 2020, right? They all ended up being in within five weeks of each other, six weeks yeah. of each other. That's right. Mm-hmm. But we got a lot of great raw material that we're going to be sharing oh, with you guys over the next few months. And uh, yeah, because there's we got tons of photos. We got great aerial drone footage that you know you just saw a few seconds out of hours of drone seconds. footage that we have so um we're gonna keep laura busy for sure absolutely absolutely so in the scab lands um let's just talk about that a little bit because we kind of left off with our last podcast talking about the scab lands and the formation of the scab lands and the great floods and all of that so can i stop you there for just to just of course. to wrap that up because yeah um, pe- people ought to go ahead to the Randall Carlson website if they haven't already and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, yeah. And they'll get all the announcements about when these events are happening. These, when these tours are happening, when the sacred geometry classes are going to be happening. Uh, Randall is writing about, uh, recent news items. Um, so there's good info in there and that's a good place to find out when these events are going to be coming up. Um, so. And yeah, social really media easy. as well. That's right. Follow on Twitter. Instagram, Facebook, the Randall Carlson, the Randall Carlson or Randall W. Carlson on Twitter. All right. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt there, but no, no, no problem. I thank you. Fine. Yeah. So, um, Russ and Kyle, this was your first experience of the scab lands, right? That's right. All right. So now you've had a chance. You've had some time since the, trip was over to digest and think about what you saw any thoughts impressions anything well it was clear from us going over the material a lot with you here on the show that it was a it's a vast complex Mm -hmm. but we both were aware that until you really get into it you really you know you know looking at pictures and looking at overhead looking at google earth doesn't really give you the Mm -hmm. full scale no. But then when we got out there, I, I then b- began to understand that even standing in it, you can't really comprehend the full scale because it's too big. Even when you're standing in it, it's too like, so it, it, the, the enormity of it just became more impressed into my mind. Mm-hmm. I knew it was an enormous complex, but then when you're standing in like that area the, that's behind Brad right there, you're standing there, you know, and there's a steamboat rock and you're just, you're looking at it. You're like, okay, this is, it's still too big. This, yeah. the, Russ, the, this is Potholtz Cataract. Oh, okay. My bad. Not yeah. Steamboat Rock. That's not Steamboat Rock? No, that's not. Nope. That's what the r- great rock blade of Potholtz Cataract. Okay. All right. They look the same, basically. They're the same kind of formation. They're both enormous. They look exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, I mean, yeah, their formation <laughs> is basically the, the same thing. Jake, the tremendous shear forces of, of yeah. violently turbulent rushing water. Yeah. Um, the difference is that in this case, the, the rock blade behind Brad, there is more like a peninsula than an Island. It has not yet become detached from the main bulk of the, of the basalt bedrock, hmm. but you can see actually right behind Brad's shoulder there on the left, there's a saddle in the, yeah. yeah so it, it doesn't like it go all detached. the way down to the, to the, uh, the coulee floor but it goes about halfway down. So yeah. that's just the level of the erosion at the time the floodwaters, you know, fi- finally um, ended. Right. But had it been going any any uh, length of time beyond what it did, maybe even only a day or a couple of days even, then the rock blade would have been an isolated, more like an island, freestanding. Yeah. And, and remember uh, Umatilla Rock at, at Dry Falls? That's still more like a peninsula. That's why it's a rock blade. But again, it's a function of at what point did the floodwaters finally cease flowing? And that's the state of erosion at that point. It's almost like a freeze frame view 
of where this dynamic erosional process is at the time the forces that are uh, producing this tr geomorphic transformation cease to function, if that makes sense. It's also a function of how far apart those two cataracts were from each other at the start of their formation, right? Like the farther apart they were, the longer it would take the water to... Uh, well, yes, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. And what we're actually seeing here is there's two alcoves. Right, and this, yeah. this rock blade is is separating. So there's an alcove on the right there, um, which you can't see the floor of it in the distance. But if you could, there are giant current ripples on the floor. Yeah. And then there's another uh, alcove to the left here. Yeah, right there where Brad's fingers is, is is where those current ripples are. Yeah, you can kind of see them a little bit. Yeah, that's where there, it's a big, big bar. Uh, a, uh, um, a de uh, an eddy bar or a delta bar. It's, no, this would probably be an eddy bar. Um, but yeah, so the water in that picture is moving away from the viewer towards the Columbia Valley in the distance. In the you know that you can you can't see the Columbia River, but it's back there. So your impression then, Russ, that you your takeaway of it was the enormity of the complex. Yeah, and it since I was driving. It really struck me on, you know, we spent five days driving hundreds of miles and still we only saw a tiny piece of the full complex of, of features. Yeah. And driving through it all, I became fully aware of that. And then, of course, standing in the features like there or in various other ones and you're like, you know, one cliff is over there and it's it's faded by distance. And then the other cliff is over there and it's also faded by distance and you really become aware of just how gigantic this is and i'm just and i and then i think about how and i'm still only standing in one small part of it that really made a huge impression on me is, mm. is you know and then and then also that's just one part of that particular you know there's two scabland features basically that the what is it the i can never remember the names of. Them i can't this. believe you're trying to name something else i know you just I'm got roasted a, for giving something yeah, the wrong i name. shouldn't even shouldn't even try just avoid oh, the name yeah. well you may Telford, uh, make Cheney a gallant Palouse. try <laughs> and i'll try to be well, i'll like, try to go easy there's like on the you. cheney palouse and then the other one telford. cheney palouse yeah and telford 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 yeah oh i was muted as well. yeah so we we didn't even go up into telford right that's what i'm saying we were just in one yeah. So while we're in that one, I'm thinking in my mind of the overhead maps you've shown us. I'm like, we're just in one part of this one, and there's that <laughs> other one over there. <laughs> just like, oh my god, yeah, it's that gigantic. Was, yeah. We didn't get to Wallula Gap, right? We couldn't make it to Wallula Gap. It's too it, far. It, it was disappointing to me to find out that the access road up to the top has been closed. Mm. Maybe there's, and yes. we're gonna have to find an alternative because that viewpoint overlooking Wallula Gap. Kyle knows how to drive a bulldozer. Yeah, or we could bribe someone. <laughs> bribe. Well, yeah. They're they're growing. I don't know if it's a vineyard. I don't think so, but they had uh, crops growing up there. So I would yeah, just pay them. Somebody's, somebody's taken over uh, the property. Yeah, it's not barren anymore. It's lush and green, which That's is very awesome. different. Oh, yeah, yeah, but you can still hike up there. It's just, you know, just time consuming. And then Steptoe Butte was really impressive for multiple reasons, of course, the, you know, driving up. Like first driving through the landscape of of all that lust was just I mean, mm -hmm. that was beautiful in a completely different way. And of mm -hmm. course it's beautiful in part because of the agriculture, but it's also interesting because the agriculture gave it contour lines where you could really mm -hmm. see the the way the landscape was moving. And it was like driving through a frozen stormy ocean. Mm hmm Yeah. Gigantic waves that were frozen in place. And then you circle the butte going up and it, and you know, the landscape is getting lower and lower and you're beginning to see more and more of it. And it was just really awesome. Of course, I couldn't do a whole lot of looking because I was supposed to be staying on the road because I was driving, <laughs> but I could hear, yeah. I could hear my passengers going, Oh wow. And I'm like, yeah, I got to look at the road, but and then you get to the top and you realize that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Left. And then you get to the top and you realize that this thing that we're standing on had like survived the process that made all that stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. And Kyle brought up the idea that perhaps some people survived the process by standing on top of that thing and witnessing the changing of the whole pla of the whole world around them. Wouldn't and that, that be was something? Yeah, that was an interesting idea. I was just like, oh my god, yeah, they would think that the world had ended because everywhere around you up there is just. Well, you got a picture in the aftermath of the floods. Like, let's say it's in the week after the floods are over. 
you know what you're going to be looking out on. You're going to be looking at all of that rolling stuff, but it's all going to be mud. That's right. As far as the eye can see, pretty much in every direction, massive rolling mounds of mud. So, yeah, that if you manage site, to survive, yeah. That site made the biggest impression on me. I mean, I love the waterfalls and the and, and the dry falls. They were they were awesome, but in terms of just um, looking at the scale of, of the of the, the landscape, event, yeah, that th- just the whole drive all the way to Steptoe Butte, and then you know being down in those rolling hills and seeing how enormous every single one of them was, yeah. and then going up on Steptoe Butte and you're like, it looks like tiny little ripples out there, you know they. It's, it, uh, that, that really made a, a big impression on me. Uh, but I, I'm, I felt the same as Russ, just the, the, being there realizing like, okay, I can get more of the scale of like the immediate, uh, surroundings, but it's also making me aware that I cannot even comprehend the scale of the entire event. It's just too, it's too big. It's too much. Yeah. I mean, you would need a minimum and it depends again how where you draw your boundaries. But I mean, a minimum of two weeks to follow the flood created landscape, let's say from Portland to Missoula, Montana. And to, you know, tangent off into some of the, you know, uh, the sub routes, if you will, you know, because there's so many different dimensions to this whole thing, you know. Um, I mean, you know, even in, in the stuff that we looked at over five days, I mean, we could have really just spent easily much more time at every site that we stopped at and looked at all. I mean, there was all kinds of like in Moses Cooley, there was places we could have spent all day in Moses Cooley, for example. Yeah. But but it was also, you know, you're standing in one of those cataracts or above it, looking down at it or down inside of it, looking up at the at the, you know, at the the wall mm-hmm. and you're like this wasn't just a waterfall that but up on top of the landform there was another four or six hundred feet of water yeah that was when you really began to grasp like i can't understand how big this was there's just uh, like i understand it in terms of like abstract i can look at the numbers or the math and say that you know it was so many hundreds of millions of cubic feet of water but i like in reality i can't picture it i can't really yeah. grasp the scale of the event. And that's what really was impressed on me on this trip. You know, every time we're standing in one of these features, I'm trying to remind myself how much water was moving past me and how many hundreds of feet it was over my head or over the top of the cliff that was way over my head. And it just, it was a continual impression of, of an impossible scale to grasp. Mm -hmm. And it continued for weeks, potentially, you know, not just, yeah. An hour, right? Or a day, <laughs> yeah. Kept coming, kept coming, kept coming. Yeah, Crazy. yeah. When I was when I was camping at potholes, I was thinking about that at night. Like, oh, it just it would still be going. It would just be going day. I mean, it would be dark in the day too, but it's just going day and night. I would guess though that this feature, like behind Brad, you're probably looking at. If, if I was going to make an educated, and this was nothing more than a guess, but a somewhat of an educated guess, one to two weeks. One, still, to, one to two weeks. That's still. Wow. <laughs> but when you're talking about two or 300 million cubic feet per second. For two so right weeks. Right here where, where, where this is, the water was at least a couple of hundred feet deep, pouring over the ridge. And to start the down cutting. Yeah. Because... And and you remember Drumheller Channels? See, we didn't even go down into Drum. We just skirted Drumheller Channels, you know. And that's where that's where you guys did the rock diving. Yeah, we jumped. In, yeah, people jumped in the water. People right. jumped in the water. Yeah, that was. Um, yeah, so Drumheller Channels. Picture that at the head of that, you've got a, a river. If you can picture a river, four hundred feet deep and nine miles wide, moving fifty to sixty miles an hour. Right. See, you you lost me there. Like, uh, in in the sense that, like, I understand the numbers, but I know that I can't really grasp that. Like, I can say, okay, I've imagined a river a couple miles wide, 50 to 60 feet deep, moving 20 miles an hour. But once you've got it going 60 or 70 and it's 
<laughs> Typically, you know, you look at the Mississippi River. We're down, you know, we're Natchez or below. So you got a river that's close to a mile wide. Right. Maybe at its deepest, it might be 100 to 150 feet deep. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's probably it moving be? five to eight miles an hour. There you go. Yeah. Right. So picture that Mississippi River. Now, the normal, I think, I know that the peak flood discharge of the Mississippi River. The 1923 flood, I believe, and then the 1993 flood topped out over a million cubic cubic feet per second. So that means, you know, you got mark any point along the river and every second, a million cubic feet is moving past that point, right? Well, here where Brad is, you're looking at probably somewhere around 300 million cubic. In other words, imagine that you've got, you know, flood stage of the Mississippi River times 200 and that's what left this landscape that's behind brad here yeah and again it's not just water right right there's just all kinds of stuff gushing through the bottom and toiling and roiling and rocks Toi and trees toiling and roiling and and all look the these and uh, the left yeah. of the clovis folks yeah and, uh, and who all knows what all was at the whole of that. whole forests are floating on the top and boulders are rolling along the bottom it must have been incredibly noisy oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and well and you got a picture look these cliffs here are like 400 feet high yeah right so that means for, for and this is a mile over to the rim so you got a picture for 400 feet a mile long and what probably half a mile wide all of that material is being ripped out of there so that's all being taken up into these the roiling floodwaters and being swept along and of course then the bigger stuff gets broken up and the further it gets transported the finer the material gets that's why you can use um size changes as a paleo current indicator because whenever you have a depositional event the big stuff gets dropped first and then it gets successively finer so from big to fine will be your directional indicator of the flow so Laura, what was, what was your other perceptions of it? You, you've stayed out there for a couple of weeks since, but, uh, yeah, you were on the trip with us. What, what really struck you? I mean, I can echo the, the scale of it, uh, being just unexpected. I, I was not expecting the hugeness of it, you know, the actual, reality of looking out at the mm -hmm. the Palouse like where you could not see the end of the Palouse was crazy to me you couldn't see you know the canyons on, on the other side that were a whole other um, yeah but you knew they were there right exactly yeah, yeah. and it was, it was just a whole other phenomenon that was all part of the same thing, but it, we were just, you know, we drove, how long did we drive to get there? Like two hours. Oh yeah. hundred miles over there from the soap lake. Yeah. So, um, Stepto Butte for me, uh, I just, I keep thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to go back there. Soon. Yeah. Well, that's why, oh, you know, good. I've been both Brad and I, I think we're equally impressed by that. The first time we ever got up there, <laughs> which was 98. Yeah, we know it was 98 year. because, yeah, yeah, first year we went there. And um, we've been bringing people back ever since because it's a, it's an eye-opener. It's a mind-blower and an eye-opener. Yeah, can, it's one of a kind, it feels like, that place. Yeah, how there's people, probably no uh, other place quite like that anywhere. How many people go up there, you know, throughout the year and just look at the view but have never been taught, you know, what the... Right, what, what the story what is. Yeah. Yeah, be nice yeah, to have a gigantic plaque up there that explains it all, <laughs> to the best of our knowledge. Or uh -huh. I was wondering what the farmers think too, the people who farm that land. Got dang hills. That's probably what they're yeah. flat. Yeah. <laughs> they're probably annoyed. <laughs> Damn gravel. <laughs> you can see them trying to make squares. You know, when you're up high, you can see like these yeah. attempts at like they're, they're trying to drive their tractors in straight lines, and it won't let them. You could see that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, the lust does is incredibly fertile topsoil. Yeah, those yeah. farmers are doing a great job. Yeah, farm. I mean, it's just beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. yeah, that is 
truly what I would call a pastoral landscape. Yeah. Almost like something you'd expect to see in uh, um, Middle Earth. Yeah. And people kept calling it the, uh, what was it, the the Windows XP <laughs> default background yeah. is what yeah. it looked like. Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> but what? <laughs> Yep. It just looks like a like an old the old Windows standard background when you just first the, load the it's like just, the home screen oh, yeah, yeah the just home that screen super just, green grass and the really blue oh, sky oh, oh, I was like yeah. yep that was it <laughs> took it right there that's right but yeah the way you guys described it to drive down in it and see how huge they are and be kind of buried within these hills yeah and then to rise above it and see how really tiny they look once you yeah, get above you, it. And they're, yeah. as Laura says, as far as you can freaking see. Right. They're in every direction. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. all yeah, you and can the see. That just that one thing is left as a perfect I know. point. I yeah, know. Right. That We're one. Right in the middle oh, nice. of it all. It's yeah. right in the center of it, too, almost, isn't it? Yeah, it's 3,000 square much, yeah. miles. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of makes me think that maybe the contractor said, "Hey, let's just leave this part here so these people can get up and see how, <laughs> see how cool this landscape contractor. really is." Yeah, when you're driving up to it, you're like, "Oh, look at that little butte." Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> and then you're climbing it, and you're like, "Oh my god, this is not very small." <laughs> yeah. And no. then you get to the top, and you're like, "Look at all the little hills!" <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just... Did anybody get seasick on the way there? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much yeah i was i was sitting on the outside edge of the van when we were going up so oh right i was i had a little bit of vertigo looking down there yep well yeah, you know maybe it was the a thing, great the trip thing would mind, be you know, so if we trip. went if we went down up or down fast enough in that spiral i'm wondering what what might happen oh yeah if, you, if we went up mm. fast enough on that spiral we might teleport to a different dimension or something is that what you're talking about That's That's kind of, yeah thinking. something we along might, those we lines we might open a portal yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> some abnormal experience <laughs> That's right. so okay th- before we move on then what about palouse falls yeah that oh, was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was it was gorgeous gigantic waterfall and then you're just like the that's just rainbow. a trickle yeah right yeah just a trickle and yeah. and what's the interesting story associated with Blue Oh Falls? yeah, that's the the how could I have been so wrong spot, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. James Galuli. Yeah, where he finally caved in and his eyes were opened. Right. It was awesome too because mm. that's another one where when you're standing out, you know, up looking mm. down at it, you you understand that it's big, but you still don't really get the scale. Right. But when I flew the drone down into there. You know, there's that that spot that's like a it's like a remnant of the and it's all columnar basalt. And there's this remnant right there where the where the where the river is coming out of a canyon and then it kind of takes a 90 degree turn and goes over the right. falls. Right. And there's this remnant. It looks like a city. You know, it's got this because it's columnar yeah. basalt. It looks it mm-hmm. kind of looks like an old city. And I flew the drone down there and it was only when I was flying the drone past that thing that I realized how freaking big it is. Like it's huge that little outcrop of that columnar basalt is is enormous mm-hmm. uh, yeah if you get the people down in there there's yeah, a there's trail some, and you you get some scale yeah it's right whatever 50 I got 60 some, feet high and you have no clue that it really is that big right you're, you're talking some, about that outcrop right up on the rim yeah the castle looking yeah yeah, 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 like yeah. A castle down yeah, there yeah. yeah totally yeah it looks like a city skyline yeah, yeah. You know? exactly uh-huh. yeah and I was yeah, flying the drone down. There were people. Yeah, there were people walking around, and I was looking at the screen, just like, "Oh my god, the thing's gigantic! It's enormous." Yeah, it's Damn not people. like ten or twenty feet high. No, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, once again, you know, it's the scale. The scale of this whole phenomenon is is. Look, I'll uh, you know as much as I've gone out there and traversed this landscape, I still haven't ra- wrapped my head around the scale of it. Yeah, I probably never will. Because, see, the thing is, as soon as you think you've started to, to get a handle on it, you realize, no, you know, you're thinking, okay, I've got some bounds on this thing. Yeah. And then you learn more and you realize, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not, those bounds aren't there. Those, yeah. don't, you know, that's yep. why we've been led all the way up to, you know, middle of British Columbia. You just can't think big enough. See, that's what <laughs> Mike's been telling us for there years now. He t- tells me I'm not thinking big enough. <laughs> but I'm getting there, Mike. You know, it's a, uh, it's not easy. Let me it's tell you. True. It's, well, it takes I got some a new effort. perspective on it from, for driving cross country again and going up repeatedly 
through the underfit river channels. Yeah. You know, just up, up through Missouri, across the Dakotas, across Montana, you know, they're just one after another. You're in this huge spillway. Yeah. Just again and again. And it's, yeah, it, it's like Randall says, many times we've been out there and, and seen it and try to grasp the, the immensity of it. It still keeps getting bigger. Yeah, I, I came up the Snake River Plain and I was thinking I was going to see either side. And you just you sort of don't see it most of the time. It's just on either side of you out of view. It's flat, mm. flat, flat. And then half the time you don't even see it. So did you go to the like the Perrine Bridge? No, you, I didn't were you following the Snake River? Um, yeah, I yeah, came she was up in... through the, the basin and range. Okay. Like through the Great Basin. And then I, uh, she and then I pretty much Twin followed Falls. the Snake River Plain. You went through Twin, Twin Falls. Falls to see Shoshone Falls. And, oh, okay. Yeah, she was, she was right there. Well, did you see any yeah. bridges across the canyon? Because if you did, that was probably the Prine Bridge. What's the name of the other one? Um, there's two spectacular bridges H there. Hanson? That, that, yeah, Hanson. Uh, Hanson Bridge. I think that's it. I think so. Two spectacular I just went to the bridges. Falls. Okay. Did you go over the falls in a barrel while you were there? I did. Okay, cool. Yeah. Did we get video? <laughs> I got some footage. Got okay. The follow yeah. me drone working for of the you. inside well, of the yeah. Well, yeah, black. if yeah. I <laughs> yeah, if I get a drone, I'll get some better footage. <laughs> okay. Get it in 4K. So we went the, the furthest uh to the northeast that we went was to the so-called Bolin Pitcher, which is right on the Spokane River. Now the Spokane River was one of the flood uh routes for flood currents issuing out of the Spokane Valley. And so uh, if we had gone further up the Spokane Valley, we would have come to Lake Ponderé. Now, Lake Ponderé has significance, and that is where the supposed ice dam was. Um, and so uh, we didn't actually, if, if we let that ice dam kind of be a divisor, dividing line between two dimensions of the phenomena, if, we, if we're thinking in the terms of the conventional model, to the east of Lake Ponderé, you would have been inside the lake, right? To the west of Ponderé, you would have been outside the reservoir, outside the dam, outside the lake. So that's, that's the main difference there that you want to grasp in order to understand this, that you got the ice dam there coming down the valley where Lake Ponderé, can you guys picture that or do I need to pull up a graphic? Because I want to segue into discussion of the ice dam and the efficacy of ice to um We're doing probably, a break, uh, so that would a be a good divisor before yeah. you start into that. Yeah, yeah okay. Then I'll pull up some graphics. We can look at that. And then we're going to uh, talk about ice dams. Um, because that's right. the critical thing there is that, um, and even in the alternate model that I'm proposing, that area still would have been significant, um, but not in the same way. Um, but in any case, there was an ice load that came down there. And so we were in this trip that we took when we went to the bowl and pitcher, that would have been somewhere very close to that mm -hmm. southwest terminus of the ice lobe. So we would have been below the, if we'd continued north up the Spokane, like when we went up uh, and we were in that flat area by the railroad tracks that didn't seem very interesting. Yeah, it was right but, at the state line right at the state line. Yeah. That would have actually been under the ice. Mm. That, that, that valley was filled with ice. See, if we'd continued North and then East up the Clark Fork Valley, at some point we would have also gotten to the edge of the Clark Fork sub lobe. And we can look at this on a graphic when we get back from break, but see, so we never got to the other side of the, the ice lobe, the ice dam. If we did, if we'd gone a few miles further to the east, we would have been inside the lake basin. And so that whole region of the of the giant flood phenomena, we didn't even look at. But there's a whole easily week of exploration 
on that side of, on the Eastern side of the ice dam. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. And then we never even got down to Wallula Gap and were able to traverse down the, the lower Columbia through the gorge to see all of the spectacular effects of the floods down th uh, through that reach of the Columbia River. And then, of course, we didn't get north into British Columbia, like up towards Lake Okanagan um, or up to some of those areas up there where um, I am arguing is where the uh, flood water originated. Moses Cooley was also amazing driving down through that stuff. Mm -hmm. oh, that yeah. was beautiful. And then Devil's Canyon, is that what it's called? Yeah. That was right. that right. really impressed me. We, we didn't really, you know, we, we just drove through it, but it was absolutely beautiful for one thing. And then the uh -huh. second thing that really impressed me was that there was no secondary channel, which kind of down at the bottom, which kind of showed, and there was no water in there, which kind of showed me like this happened yeah. one time with a catastrophic flow that came through here and cut this whole thing. And now there's, there's no river there now. Right. You know, so right. it, that was, that was absolutely amazing. So yeah. yeah. I, I know Devil's Canyon totally extinct. Yeah. Feature in the yeah. landscape. Completely extinct. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. So but we the spent, events, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, we spent four full days touring around. Um, and I guess it was 900, maybe you guys remember on your van, it was not quite a thousand miles we covered yeah, just, in four just, days. So we're going to add an extra day on the next trip coming up and we could as we could easily add five more full days and see totally different things. Yeah. Easily. Wow. Just, just in the Washington quad yeah, yeah. before we even get to the other side where Lake Mo the Missoula temporary Lake was. Let's yes. just go for a whole year. Okay. The entire okay. year, we'll just drive the entire outside of it all the way up through Canada and all the way back around. You know, we'll just get the whole thing. Well, the you know, we're going to have to do a traverse of the Mackenzie River because right. the Mackenzie was a, a was a gigantic <laughs> meltwater flood gushing into the Arctic Ocean. Oh yeah, and that flood appears to date very close to the Younger Dryas boundary, we'll which to, to me it. is very interesting. But yeah, so there's scab lands and canyons and coolies and cataracts and everything up there along that reach of the Mackenzie as it flows north into the Arctic. Sounds like a good summertime trip. Yep. Oh yeah, and then right hey, up wait, along summer there, summer starts next week. <laughs> All right, <Let's> go. <laughs> tune up the band. And then there's this recurrent episodes of catastrophic emplacement impact related microspheres. We're going to talk about this report. We'll probably save it for the next episode, but uh, yeah. yeah, dovetails okay. right on in with um, the whole scenario that we're piecing together. All right, well, let's take a quick break, break, and we'll be uh, we'll be right back. We'll be right, right back with my hydroelectric ice dam theory. <laughs> okay, can't wait yeah. to hear it. Break that down. I mean, it was a great recovery. <laughs> it, was, it was really smooth. So I was like, okay, well, I'll leave that in there. Then. Yeah. <laughs> Mike was asking you, how are you going to get away? If, it, if you get stopped by the sheriff in South Georgia and you have a bag of the CBD flower, the flower, right? right, right. Oh, you know, he's like, are you going to really get away with that? By being like, <laughs> I trust me, officer. It's just CBD flower. Nope. <laughs> Straight to jail. <laughs> oh, instead, here, try the gummies. Live. Yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> That'll work. I got some edibles, man. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, man. I got some edibles here, man. <laughs> All right. Unbox some stuff here. All right. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, we're going to go to Lake Ponderé, I hope. But uh, before we do that, Randall is going to do the first unboxing on the Cosmographia show. We got some something special in the mail, right? Is that, is that what's going on? Well, yeah. This show us how it's done. This package arrived right here. Uh -huh. So it just arrived just before the show started. Um, so I thought I'd go ahead and just open it. Um, See it what's in box. there. So I've got my trusty little Swiss Army knife. I never go anywhere without my Swiss Army knife, by the way. Don't go to the airport for a sporting event. No, I've actually had a, one of my beloved Swiss Army knives confiscated at I the airport. It. I know it. And um, 
that really they did not turn it. No. Okay, we're almost. Oh, so we're we're getting there. I sh- you know what I should do? Flap should, A, flap B. Yeah, this oh, is no, what we should it. do. I saw the calculator, folks. He's actually got it sitting he right has there. The calculator. <laughs> There we go. All right, let's see what we got here. Oh, some bubble wrap. I just what I've wanted, always that's wanted. That's an interstellar jumpsuit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's yes. I actually did order this. Um, so yes, but actually, it's an interdimensional jumpsuit. Man, jackpot! What do we got here? Let's see. What do we got? Gummies. Hmm. Is that what the, I don't know. Are you sure? No, the big no, the one big, is the, the bigger gummies. one, I think. I don't know yeah. about the small stuff. I don't know what no, that let's is. Let's see what we got here. That's the okay. salve. That's got to be salve. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Beth. Where is it? There, there, there we go. Arthritis no more. See, they. I particularly like this salve because they put my picture on the cover. So Not quite working. Not quite working. Oh. There's there a resemblance. Go. Almighty Zeus. No, 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 Mike. This is Apollo. Apollo. Ah, okay. Yeah, so Sav, I got me some Sav. Yeah, I love this stuff. All right, and I've been needing it. Okay, what do we got here? Another Sav. All right, I don't think we need to open that. What do I got here? Um, oh, that's, I know what that is. Uh, Two boxes of out. the oil, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got me a couple of bottles here, so I'm good to go, man. And I tell you what, this stuff has really made a huge difference on our tours that we're doing. Yes, helps me a lot for sure. Especially, I've noticed, is when it's been really the most helpful is when I need to sleep. We're on these tours and just the level is up, you know, and I'm so excited I can't sleep. But this is really, well, you recall... Where were we when I basically borrowed all of yours and you oh, went yeah, without? Was, yeah, that was so, so the, that I could get a good night's sleep. <laughs> that was <laughs> yeah, the that first was, Southwest trip. First six Southwest ago, trip, yeah. yeah. Ah, and I remember, yes. I remember in Pagosa that you were having a hard time with the sleeping. Yes. And that was before, yeah. That was before. I always did have a hard yeah. time tra- mm-hmm. sleeping when I was traveling. Yeah. Brad and I have always used the secret sauce called beers. Yeah. You, Kyle mm-hmm. and Brad, yeah, we just, don't have any problems. Just drink, be- drink all the beers and then. By 3 p.m. or 3 a.m., they're passed out. Well, have you heard the old fairy tale story about the princess and the pea? <laughs> she had the, the, the pea was under like 30 mattresses yeah, and she I've couldn't heard that. sleep because, yeah, you remember that story? Yeah. Uh-huh. If you don't, look it up. Are well, you that's not quite that bad, but that's kind of like me when I'm on a trip and I'm not <laughs> in my own bed, in my own room, in my own house, with my own noises and my own pillow and my own sheet. <laughs> so let me tell you what this CBD from the gods. It's yeah. helped. So we got one more. Let me get, let me get this open and we'll have a look here and uh, see what we've got. <gasps> look, gummies, gummies, yeah. yummy gummies. <laughs> let me see, make sure they yes, you know, well sealed here. Ah, new, any new flavors? Um. What have I got? I think that I got the strawberry lemonade. That's that's what I got too. You said there's like a pear. I don't think I've had one of the pear. All right, there we go. Yummy, gummy. Look at here. Okay. You still haven't gotten a box of those, Mike? I have you not. finish them all. Here we go. You better get over here to Randall's tomorrow. Go. So okay. yeah, you couldn't. Uh, you know the. Uh... Oh, there he goes. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my slogan was, for them is uh, peaceful, easy feeling. But, uh, you know, you can't take over an Eagle song title. But, I mean, that would be mm. to- totally the uh, uh, the jingle for those. Yeah. Peaceful, easy feeling. Well, here we are, just like Christmas in June. Absolutely. Mm. I'm going to set this aside so that's, for now. That's what happens to Santa. You get your presents in the summertime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> sorry you, but that's really good i wish there was a way i good could one, Brad. hand you guys here you guys have a have a gummy but they do look good right now 
we're not at that level of technological expertise yet. Not yet. Okay. So this still isn't right yet. That wow. Good there you job. Go. Perfect. You nailed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm getting there. Normally, we have to uh, work on that for 10 minutes. Yep. That was going to take a while. <laughs> Randall's been practicing. He's been practicing. <laughs> so I'm good at it. But if I can keep at it for another few weeks or a month, I'll get the, t- I got two rooms that I'm going to convert into a new studio. I see. Yeah. All right. You get it. Just in I'm time to have the new studio set up. Two rooms. Take the wall out. Right now, there's a wall and two little old closets between the two rooms. In that wall is buried a fireplace that's not used because the chimney just kills off under the roof line up in the attic. Tear that out and refurbish the room and turn it into a podcasting studio. Awesome. Well, I'm really looking forward to the day that's finished, but it's, it'll take a little doing. Um because I've got too much else going on, but uh, it's the process has started. So anyhow, yeah, um, CBD from the gods. That's right. Go to cbdfromthegods.com. Check them out. If you order something, uh, enter the promo code RC Ships Free. You get free shipping. Uh, great people. And as you can see, Randall loves their products. And uh, well, Russ, Russ, I'm uh, using them and loving them too. Also, are you? Are you? Okay. Yeah. It's just me and Brad. I mean, me and Mike, normal guy. Yeah. I don't. I use. I only use the oil, but it's great. I do have some of the gummies. They're they're pretty good. But yeah, for me, I don't have any trouble sleeping. I did take the oil one night. Yep, I gave you some sleep, right, but yeah. I, you said you used the salve on your feet or something though. I did some one point, time. Yeah. Really, yeah. yeah, they were hurting me pretty bad at work, and I used it, and it seemed to work. Pain went really? away. So. Really? Yeah. That's the only time. Yeah, Br- Brad gave me some of the salve, and I was using it on my hurt ankle, and it uh, helped it since I got home. So. All right. Excellent. That's right. You had a hurt ankle, didn't you? Hob- yeah. You were hobbling around up there in Washington on your hurt ankle. Yep, she was hobbling around and beating yeah. people with her cane. Yep, didn't stop her. Get out of my way! And I, yeah, I remember thinking, um, <laughs> "She's red gal's a trooper." Yeah, <laughs> climbed everything everybody else did. And then... <laughs> That's all you needed was a stick. <laughs> <laughs> it actually did. I didn't get to go as high up on things that, as I wanted to go. So next time, I'm going to get another magnitude higher, for sure. That's the plan. We'll get you back there. I'm the top. Okay. Well. Okay, guys. Are uh, should we get back to the subject at hand? Yes. Yeah. Um, you were going to show us a graphic so that we can. Uh, so we can help visualize understand. what we're talking yeah. about here. Okay. Yeah. So let me then pull up a map. And all right, here's what we're talking about. So this is the Columbia Basalt Plateau, and this is the area of the Scabland, the Channel Scabland. The Channel Scabland proper is actually the two Scabland tracks, Cheney Palouse, which is right in here, and the Telford, which is over here. But when we were talking about Lake Pend we're talking about this lake right here. And this this reach of the lake right here, uh, pretty much right under where the uh, the lettering is, is about 1,100 feet deep. So here was the ice lobe. We'll call it the um, Purcell Trench Lobe. Because if we go up here, this is the Purcell Trench right here and it's got a lake in it and that's lake kootenay and it's one of the ribbon lakes these long very deep elongated lakes that occupy these troughs in the canadian rockies and so this entire trough right here this trench was filled with a lobe of glacial ice and that glacial ice would have undoubtedly also covered these mountains bear in mind now that the way this process begins 
is it starts with mountain glaciers and then the mountain glaciers grow down the valleys into the into the uh the trenches the main trenches then they fill the trenches and then eventually the thickness of the ice in the trench gets uh thick enough that it buries most of the mountains completely except for their the peaks of the highest mountains which are called nunatax nunatax um and we can pull up a picture of that uh kyle while you're doing there Look while you're sitting there. Look up N U N A T A K S, and see if you find a picture. And then we will. Uh, you can show it when I get done looking at this map. So, anyways, all of this area was buried under ice. But right here, you had this lobe of ice that came down and extended through the valley. Right here is the Spokane Valley, extended through the Spokane Valley and apparently terminated somewhere right in here, somewhere around the city of Spokane, where it is now. Other versions of it have shown it only coming just beyond the southern uh, limit of Pend Oreille, which for, uh, to me seems very problematic because you have to remember, there's a marginal profile. There's a gradient. As you move towards the, the terminus or the snout of a glacier, there's a gradient, so it might be a thousand feet thick, you know, ten miles up from the snout, but then that has to taper down to almost basically zero when you get to the snout. Although it doesn't taper uniformly, I mean, because typically what it'll do, it'll it'll at the snout it can be several hundred feet thick or more. But the point is, is it's much much thinner at the snout, so you have that marginal profile, you have that sloping surface of the glacier that gets thicker as you move up glacier away from the snout. So the thing to keep in mind here is that given that the high water mark here in the Clark Fork Valley is at 4,200 feet above sea level, that means that the top of the ice dam has to be above that by at least seven or eight to 10%. Because, you know, what is uh, ice is what, 92, 93 percent the density of water so you know it, it, the, the the ice has to be thicker than the water is deep or the water is going to lift the glacier from the ground beneath right it'll float the glacier um because the glacier is lighter than water okay so what that means is is that the thickness of the ice has to be minimum more than the depth of the water that it makes up for that deficiency. So if the top of the water here in the Clark Fork, like right around here, like where it says Noxon, Triangle Pond, Cabinet, right here, this would have been the westernmost region of, the, of Lake Missoula. And right in here somewhere, there would have been this transition from ice to water. Now, what's the marginal profile of the sublobe? Now, for, for, to get the nomenclature, the main lobe that comes down through here passes through the Pondere Basin right here, wraps around through here, probably buried this upland in the middle, then came down and terminated here. This is the Purcell Trench lobe. Now, some amount of glacial ice would have flowed south east which is flowing up the clark fork valley and it would have terminated somewhere in here that's the presumption that there was a clark fork sublobe and it was really the sublobe that formed the dam because that's where the water is is interfacing with somewhere in here in 98 when we came out we went and i interviewed roy breckenridge who had done uh done the work here in the um in the Clark Fork Valley, because I wanted to know, we were about to go visit and make our first traverse of the valley, and I wanted to know precisely where ice met water. And basically, he couldn't tell me. He and and he, to me, the way I interpret it is, he was expressing skepticism about the whole model of the ice dam, probably for the same reason that I was beginning to question certain things about this ice dam model it just didn't make sense so 
you know, often I've seen a video where it, it's basically showing the water against the ice dam. And it's showing the ice dam. It depicts the ice dam. Maybe we can find this video online. I bet it is online somewhere as a sheer wall. And then the water is like a an ocean right up against that sheer vertical wall of ice. And that is a completely unrealistic depiction of anything that could actually ever exist in nature. And the more we explore this idea of, of the ice and the efficacy of ice to do what they're claiming it did, I, I think the more, uh, more weight, more justification there's going to be for skepticism. But so anyways, we got up to the bowl and pitcher, which is right here at Riverside State Park. So this would have been close to the terminus, but where exactly was that terminus? I haven't seen anything very precise or specific or definitive um, because it's ranged all the way from the Spokane up up to here, uh, this area right in here. And I, when we look at the several different maps, we'll see that, uh, the glacial maps. But the problem is, is with, you know, 800 million cubic feet per second coming down through the Spokane Valley, what's going to happen to moraine that's piled up in the snout of the of the glacier it's going to be eroded pretty much it's going to be washed away but when we go to google maps you'll notice something here now here's riverside state park this is we went up to here and this is where that bowl and pitcher phenomena was that we saw let's see if we got it here yeah and what's interesting about these rocks is that these are rocks that are in the process of being quarried. Well, they were in the process of being quarried when the floodwaters finally terminated. See, they were being excavated. If you look here, let's see over here. Look at this. You see what this is? This is a bedrock knob sticking up right here. Are you seeing this? Yes. The picture? Yep. The One photo good. The shore just to the left of that, too. Yeah, and this is this is what I'm guessing is the picture of yeah, the bowl and so. pitcher. Yep. Well, these it's like this these have roots into the bedrock. You see? Now, if the flood had continued, one of two things would have happened. These outcrops like this would have been completely eroded away, or they would have been separated from the base and then they would have become entrained within the within the flow and transported some distance where they would have been deposited down current some to some hypothetical distance, or they would have broken up in the, in the turbulence of the flow and become, you know, obviously hundreds or thousands of much smaller pieces. And if transported far enough would have ended up as basaltic gravel. Um, but that's what we're seeing here at bowl and pitcher is this, um, and the, the thing about this that just came up on online is that there's nobody up on top for scale. But these are enormous boulders. It's also very different than it looked when we were there. That water yeah, was, I was going to point out the water, right? Yeah, way down. I, I think some of those boulders were completely under the water. Yeah, these? All, all that yeah. up in the foreground, right? We, we didn't see any of that. Yeah, and I just remember the three big ones there. That, yeah. Well... Just look here. I mean, now, you know, now that you guys are geological forensic detectives, yeah, look yeah, here. The you see the high erosion. water lines? I can yeah. see the high water lines, yeah. Unmistakable. Even yeah. a layperson would quickly grasp that those are high water lines. Somebody painted that on there, right? Well, yeah, they go down there every morning, the foresters, and they re sure refresh could, the... Yeah, refresh the high water line, right. Uh, re refresh the high water lines, <laughs> right. So, so behind yeah. that kind of orangish area where the yeah right where your cursor is right there all that woods backed up there is a there's an extremely smooth rounded area inside that rock and i'm not sure how it got eroded in there but i think that's the bowl yeah portion of it oh, okay. of the bowl and pitcher well you must have had a turbulent eddy in there yeah right um so thank you eric a from august 2020 for that photo there yeah, yeah. thank you eric a I see you visited this place. Um, so have we. And we appreciate you uh, letting us pull up your picture on Wikipedia here rather than going into our files and folders and digging out ours. Okay, so. No wiki. 
So those are right here at Riverside, let's see, Riverside State Park right in here. Uh, here's the Spokane River, and we should be able to see the little, the footbridge. Let's see. Where's that footbridge? No? Well, doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, so look, check this out. Now you see the scab land right here? See, this is unmistakable scab land now that should be easily recognizable to you guys. But we'll zoom out. And here is the head of, of uh, excuse me, of Cheney Palouse right here which suggests to me that maybe this is where the terminus of the Purcell trench lobe is right here. And the head of these scab land tracks may be issuing right from the snout of the glacier is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. So yeah. You mentioned that That's earlier. So I was just about there. to ask then how, how do those canyons get to be flowing Northeast into the Spokane river Valley? If that's right at the margin of the ice. Well, because if this is the margin of the ice, this is all completely buried under the ice because I think it's a, a nearly a thousand feet down to the, well, let's see, I could go to Google Earth. So there's got to be a lot of water in that area where Lake Columbia was. Yes. To then be flowing back north slightly there to, to create those canyons. Yeah. So let's see the elevation of the Spokane River right here. 1500 feet. Okay. So when you get up here, you're at 2600 feet. So basically, yeah, that's what I said about a thousand feet difference between the two. So bear in mind that what you would have most likely had was a huge back ponding against, um, temporarily against this lobe. But as the lobe melted back or was literally removed, because see, here's the question you got to ask. If you got 800 million cubic feet per second coming down through here, what's going to be left of this lobe once that water has flowed out? And I think basically here we're probably looking at just big uh, backflow because, yeah, see, because right here, right, you said Lake Columbia. Well, this would have been the bottom of Lake Columbia where the Spokane River is now. Right. And the shore of Lake Columbia would have been pretty much right here at about 2,400 feet above sea level. So, and then if we go over here to the Telford, and, and we look at this. feet's pretty steep in that short distance for it to be dropping down into that. Into the oh, Spokane yeah. Valley, so so Valley, the lake, yeah. lake would have been 1,000 feet deep, about half the, half the depth of Missoula. So you can picture right here Lake Columbia pretty much right here at this ridge, which is about 2,400 feet. We come over here to um, the Great Notch at Grand Coulee. Okay, right there, we're at 2,400 feet. We go up here, 20, 2384, 2414. Yeah, so we're at 2,400 feet here. Now we go into the notch, and we're at 1,500 feet. So what it looks like, and I can easily see why it would have been interpreted this way. Flow coming through here, spilling over the rim here, and then that's cutting Grand Coulee. So the explanation is that because of the Okanagan ice lobe that you can see right here, came up this way and blocked any flow of water coming from the east and diverted it down this way next to Grand Coulee. Wait, or that's next the, to the to the uh eastern side of the ice lobe and that's what created Grand Coulee. But that so that's the standard model explanation? Yes. So how but I thought they I thought the standard model says that the flood keeps going west and then comes out of Moses Coulee. It also says that. Well then that see here's the that's where it gets problematic because that has to be a completely different flood. So, uh, oh, okay. So before the one you're talking about, then it, that would have had to have been first, right? Well, presumably. I mean, my question is, how do you get the water? I mean, where is the channel connecting Moses Coulee 
to any potential outflow from o- way over here. Right. I didn't mean to get us off topic, but that was confusing. Well, no, 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 that's not really. I mean, that's just germane to the whole topic here is that idea. You see, when Bretz first saw this, he assumed that there was simultaneous occupation, for example, of both Cheney Palouse and uh, uh, Telford, that they're flowing simultaneously. Now, was Grand Coulee flowing at the same time as Telford and Cheney Palouse? Yes or no? Well, you, you can go, okay, let's assume it was, and then you start thinking it through from there, or you say, well, let's assume that they weren't flowing simultaneously. Then you start, that is your, your point of departure and your thinking. What do you come up with? Well, whatever you come up with, it just becomes even more complicated when you try to put Moses Cooley into the mix. And right now, Moses Cooley is interpreted as being something much earlier that was a, a separate flood. From uh, the breaking of the ice dam, though, right? Well, this... A Missoula- well, I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, if if the if the ice lobe, if the Okanagan lobe is here, any water coming across this way, if it somehow manages to not get diverted south through Cheney Palouse, and it gets over here and is not diverted south through Telford Scabland and manages to continue over here, it's going to hit the Okanagan lobe. But once it does that, it's going to get diverted south and create Grand Coulee. So how the hell do you create Moses Cooley? Well, Moses right. Cooley presumably happens when what? The Okanagan lobe is not there? Right. That's well, yeah, and you remember we had we stopped and we flew the drone up here in this upper uh reach of Moses Cooley. Yeah, because it's actually more under there, right? the Okanagan lobe. Yeah. Right? And what we saw in there was evidence of of uh, enormous amounts of moraine type material yeah. mounded up, big piles of it, right? And it's assumed that Moses Cooley was cut, and then some indefinite time later, presumably from water that there was, get that, no Okanagan lobe, right? Outburst flood from Lake Missoula over here. And so the water manages to get all the way across here. Presumably, Grand Coulee can't be here because if Grand Coulee is here, what's going to happen to the water once it gets here? It's just going to get diverted south through Grand Coulee, and it ain't going to get over here and cut Moses Coulee. So Grand Coulee can't be there, right? So then how does the water get here? Well, I mean, if the if the Okanagan lobe is not there, well, okay, so it's going to get somewhere. It's got to cut a channel. How, you know, see what I'm saying? Where do you cut that channel? Because look, yeah. here's here's where it starts. The down cutting starts right in here. You can see the evidence of sheet floods that become focused. And, and we've talked about multiple times how sheet floods will get focused along a zone of weakness or a, a, a lower uh, to, uh, topographical area. And once they do that, then they that's when they start the work of down cutting to cut channels. And so what we see here is the beginning stages of the channelization of sheet flows that based upon the fact that north of here are drumlins would probably then be have to be interpreted as subglacial flows. So you've got the downcutting begins here and then it discharges beyond the mouth, beyond the snout of the Okanagan lobe. And now begins, you have now you have a free surface, a hydraulic free surface that's here it's under pressure but now it discharges and you've got a free surface and it begins down cutting like this it's diverted almost in a right angle down here then diverted again so you've got this dog leg in the coulee and down here is where you really see it taking on this dramatic scope and then it discharges and fills the whole valley here with the product, the byproduct of its erosion as it's being cut through here. But now you begin to see the problem and the thing that I'm trying to get at is how do you explain Moses Cooley as being the, the, the result of a flood 
that's coming out of the Clark Fork River. See, so here's your discharge point, and now you got to get it over here and somehow bypass all of this, or is it a lot easier just to say you had a massive subglacial flow coming down here and it discharged from the snout at this point. And in fact, I go even further than that. I would suggest that we consider, if you picture this lobe, you remember, uh, Kyle, the word supraglacial? Supra, S-U-P-R-A? Mm, uh, yeah, on top of the glacier. On top of the glacier. Yeah. See, I would argue that it's far more likely the Grand Coulee was not cut by water coming out of the Clark Fork River Valley up here, but was cut by first superglacial flows coming off the Okanagan lobe. Mm. And at the same time, you had right here the Columbian lobe. If we, if we go to that 2,400-foot mark right in here, we could presume that you had this area, the Spokane River Valley, filled with ice. And then right here, which is roughly following the route of the, uh, the Columbia River right here below the Great Dam, Grand Coulee Dam, that would have been an interlobate zone. Interlobate zone. In other words, if you can see my hands up here, Picture two lobes coming together, and there's a trough between the two lobes because the lobes are dome-like in effect. So where you have two lobes meeting, that's going to be a, a trough-like area that would be a very natural discharge point for, for glacial meltwaters to be routed. Surface glacial meltwater, supraglacial meltwater to be routed through the interlobate trough. And I am speculating that that's what you had right here, that you had waters coming down, surf, surface waters of the Okanagan lobe being funneled down this trough, which would have been, interestingly, right where the two lobes would meet, that's where Grand Coulee Dam is built. So the water then pours off the ice sheet right in this area and cuts Cuts the great notch. Hmm. That's the first time I've, uh, to my regulation, I've heard you talk about it being above the ice. I, I was thinking the whole time we were talking about outburst floods. Well, we are. But I think in order to really get the full picture of this phenomenon, we have to be thinking both in terms of superglacial and subglacial. That's cool. Yeah. And the super superglacial, you see, is going to be uh, the first that's going to, you know, it's going to be moving at a higher velocity than yeah. the subglacial Yep. initially. So the first waters, any waters being routed south off either the Laurentide or the Cordilleran ice sheets, if it's superglacial, that water is going to hit the glacial margin first. And I think once we look back over here, I think we can find the same phenomena at work over here by Flathead Lake that there were superglacial discharges that came off the flathead lobe first and then followed by subglacial discharges right. and then eventually breakup of the entire ice lobe, um, you know, and all of that breaking up of the um, trench glaciers then is carried in the floodwaters and and um, becomes part of the, the cargo. And that would have been the main cargo. You have to picture in these floods that these floods are going to be choked with armadas of huge icebergs. Icebergs of all sizes are going to be swept along in these floods. And in some places, in fact, our, we, we haven't gotten into this yet, but we're going to be looking at when we circle back to some of the areas in Canada, there are troughs. Um, that were scoured because in the flood water there were they were pushing along these giant slabs of ice, but the slabs of ice were so huge, and that the that the this thick uh, viscous water that's supercharged with sediment and debris like we were talking about is not really even lifting these icebergs off 
the ground. So as the icebergs are moving over the ground, they're like, they're gouging out these long trenches. And, and so they're iceberg scouring. And in fact, off the coast of Virginia, as far south as Virginia, North Carolina, along the continental shelf, there are giant iceberg scours where you had that would have been the consequences of the breaking up of the eastern sector of the Laurentide ice sheet and the, and the carrying of huge armadas of icebergs being swept south. That's something we'll come back to also because that's some very interesting studies. But anyways, so that, yes. So, Randall, that superglacial flows, though, coming down like you were showing into the, the Mission Valley there around Flathead Lake and then also coming down the Purcell Trench Lobe, you know, that would be the way to suddenly fill up Lake Missoula. Yes. To the first order streams, you know, yes. watershed. Exactly. That's those super glacial flows coming suddenly south off the ice sheet would, would, would be the water supply for Lake Missoula. So what's the genesis of that, uh, of that water? I well, mean, then how, that how, gets why is down it? to the, the question. You have to have some kind of a massive energy dump into the whole system. Well, to produce that much meltwater. Assuming it's an impact, mm -hmm. it makes this meltwater and, and it makes like a, a lake where the impact was full of meltwater. How does it how does it fill up to above, you know, Well, to be, a part of it is ponding on the surface of the ice and you end up with huge like shallow ponds of wa meltwater on top of the ice. Picture now come on now, Kyle. We went and we visited Meteor Crater together, didn't we? Yeah. Well, I wasn't with you, but I, I, we I have visited. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. You weren't with. Okay. We, we hadn't caught up to you guys yet. Uh, yeah. They came oh, that's me. right. Okay. So at Meteor Crater, you know that basically you have the fallback ejecta. Yeah. Right. And there's massive amounts of fallback ejecta. Now, in the case of an impact into an ice sheet, the bulk of that fallback ejecta is going to be either ice or rain. And, you know, in the, in the theory, you know, uh, in Tony Zamora's ideas, um, yep. you know, the fallback breccia is the ice boulders. And that's the basis yeah. of his whole hypothesis. But, yeah, so you're going to have this massive rain out on top of the ice sheet. The rain out itself is going to cause a, uh, okay. an enormous amount of surface melting. Just like normal rains falling over a glacier right now will cause surface melting. All right. And that water flowing over is frictional and that will cause more additional melting. See, so yep. there's kind of some feedback processes that get kicked into, into uh gear when, when this happens. Yeah. So precipitation, I, I mean, I get that. That's cool. I wasn't thinking of it in those terms. So you're right. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because you'll have, they'll have, there'll be multiple ponds. And as if one eventually breaches, it's, yeah, it starts rolling down and hits another one and picks up all that water. Correct. And, and it stacks up. And but bear time, in mind, as you're going north from here, the ice is thickening. So you're going to have a pretty continuous gradient from, yeah, yeah. you know, hundreds of miles north. And it's going to be a ramp, and that water is going to be... It's going to be a ramp, that's yeah, right. Rolling down that ramp, yeah. and picking up more and more water as it goes till it's really... Picking up more and more water as it goes. Yeah. All right, I'm buying it. You guys <laughs> sold me. All right. Super glacial <laughs> flows, bros. <laughs> And the hey, term Randall. is supra, S-U-P-R-A. Supra. That's what supra. I supra. We, supra. Randall, we have supra those pictures glacier. of the, what are they, nun attacks, noon attacks? What did you call you them? You got some? Yeah, we nun do. Nun attacks. Yeah, yeah let's have a look. I'll stop, share. Yeah, search Greenland, too, but you probably already found them. Yeah, there's some good Greenland ones. There we go. There you go. Yep. This is what the Canadian Rockies would have looked like during the late glacial maximum, or at least the maximum of the Cordier and Ice Sheet. An important uh, a piece of information relative to this whole question here is the precise dating of the late glacial maximum over over British Columbia, over the Canadian Rockies. Yeah, so these are the Nuna tax. The, yeah. the, and I so there's a lot of damn ice here. Now, try to picture that you have some means of inducing energy into the system that melts a huge amount of this ice instantaneously yeah and that's what we're having what we need to be thinking about and and, and see here here is the thing that gets me you know when you look at the canadian rockies now and then you go back to what they would have looked because that's what they would have looked like you know fourteen thousand years ago that's what they would have looked like but now all that ice is gone so 
That means that all that ice, it had to have melted at some point. Well, it melted and it flowed away. But right now, this whole lake model doesn't really look at any real connection between the, the accumulation of the lake and the melting of the, of the ice. You know what I mean? If you go, okay, well, all of this water came from Lake Missoula, over 600 cubic miles of water, right? So it's just there? I mean, where did it come from? Why is that question not the central issue here? Where did that water come from? Well, what are the options here? Russ, what do you think? What would be the options? Uh, yeah, it has to be meltwater, it seems like, right? Uh, well, or otherwise precipitation. It has, be, it has to be catastrophic precipitation or uh, it came from underground, like some kind of enormous spring. <laughs> Those go. are the That's options, the right? <laughs> well, I, okay. I was going to say, let's saying try it's to, likely. to, I'm just to telling you it's an option. have <laughs> some allegiance to the uniformitarian method here by... Okay, yes, we yeah. know springs exist, but man, I don't know about that's. Hmm, yes, I so I can see a spring, and then I multiply it by many orders of magnitude until I get that lake. That's how they the uniformitarians do it, right? <laughs> I don't. I haven't seen anybody invoking springs, except but for that's the, the problem. Base, is right. I'll just I don't call see anybody Artesian, really delving into any origin for that much water. Yeah, you know, because like you said, I mean, I mean, if you have a lake today. It's in a northern climate. Yeah, that lake can exist primarily as a result of glacial meltwater. I mean, you know, I've camped at lakes like that up on the Continental Divide, up there by the Maroon Bells in, in Colorado. You know, you have lakes there that are primarily fled, fed by glacial meltwater. Yeah. But, you know, these lakes aren't 600 cubic miles. They're only a fraction of a mile. I mean, right? So that's the question, you know, is it meltwater? Well, what's melting then? The glaciers? Well, if the glaciers are melting. How's the ice dam either, so solid? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We've been over this, but either way you look at it, if it was rain to fill up the lake all the way to the rim of the entire catchment basin, then you're not having ice everywhere else <laughs> it's not cold enough to have that solid ice and the rain is good that lake and That's the rain right. is going to erode the ice as it's coming down and filling the lake all the way up to the rim of the basin so you can't that's, have that that's the standard idea though that there was 50 to 100 years of accelerated rainfall to fill and even the lake if it basin. was even if it was just gradual well, melting the of the most, glacier you yeah. still can't have the ice dam but I still, but I have, I have a, a another question. You look uh -oh. at the size. The look at the, and this is the one I wanted was curious about at the end of our last discussion about Missoula on our previous episode. You look at the uh, the size of Lake Missoula and the depth of the water, and it's all channeling through the Clark Fork River Valley, which is relatively narrow by comparison. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to funnel all this water through that narrow, essentially much narrower channel, you're going to have incredibly high pressures. It'll be coming through there like a fire hose, but where's the evidence of all the massive erosion that would have accompanied that on, on the, at the exhaust and the output end of the channel? And where, where's the evidence well, for all that water? And is, is there enough water in, the Missoula, in Lake Missoula to cover the... Um, the massive water's output across the scab lands. I mean, to me, these things are not adding up. Well, yeah. You know what, Mike? I think we have to agree on that. They're not adding up. Um, and you yeah. asked, though, about the uh, – go, go ahead, Brad. Well, I'm well, just quickly, I mean, I imagine you're going to get to it, but just, you know, you talked earlier about the 1,100-foot deep uh, – you know, bottom of Lake Ponderé. So, so you're asking for some erosion coming out of that, that gorge. Well, you've got that right there, 1100 feet deep, but he's but also, it, Reynolds also explained how it's not necessarily a fire hose because it's in these distal basins a hundred miles away and it's got a snake its way through those canyons. And it's actually going to be, you know, perhaps kind of slow. And at that's what I'm, that's places. What, 
so so if it's if it's a slow discharge, then where where does the massive water flow across the scablands come from? Yeah, where from? do you get if, the sheet if, flow? If you've yeah. got massive sudden amounts of water flowing across the scablands, but it's slow coming slowly out of the Clark Fork River, that doesn't add up. That's right. This is why this we is, questioned it from the very first trip. Yeah. Let's <laughs> just just peak my too curiosity. Too much doesn't add up. Too okay. much doesn't add up. But if you fill it up ninety times, Mike, and then drain it. <laughs> right? That's basically what we have to do. Is. I don't like arguing the standard model at this point. <laughs> Can we just skip that part? <laughs> okay, this is what Mike just brought up. Now, this is what you see when you go through the Clark Fork Valley and look at the sides of the mountains and you see the evidence of a very violent, swift flow of water through this valley by basically just looking at the at the rock like look at the look at here you see how this is cliff faces that have been sheared off by extremely powerful currents that swept through this valley like look at look at the texture of this rock here in this case whoops the flow all right okay was from right to left and when you have something along the order of 300 to 350 million cubic feet per second, which is about nine and a half cubic miles per hour, which is what JT Pardee calculated, oh, back in 19, I guess, 43, when 42, when he wrote um, his second paper on Lake Missoula entitled Unusual Currents in Glacial Lake Missoula. Well, some of the stuff that he was looking at was like what you see right here. So he did the calculation using the Chesi formula that basically uses the channel geometry and the gradient uh, and, and puts in a, uh, a coefficient to cover turbulence in the water, comes up with a peak discharge. So he did that, used that. It's a standard engineering formula. He used that and came up with roughly nine and a half cubic miles per hour moving through the Clark Fork Valley, that lower reach. Now, he did most of his calculations right at Eddy Narrows, and Eddy Narrows, close to where this picture, these pictures were taken, here is, we'll go back to the map, and we'll pull up the map. Eddy Narrows is right down in this area right here. There you go. There it is right here. So what he did was he, in order to use this formula, you have to take a, a representative section of a, of a reach of a river or a stream. And, and the, you, it, so that's what he did right here. He got this straight section right here from Weeksville up past Eddy, where it opens into this basin right here by Thompson Falls. And he used this section of the river right here to calculate using the high water mark and the gradient. Let's see, I'm in uh, Google Earth. So here we're at. 2462 and here we're actually 2466 and the reason for that is is because there was a huge sediment dump right here in the basin which brought the the level of the uh the the, the valley floor up probably several hundred feet but so there's a there's enough of a gradient through here i mean because obviously the river is flowing from southeast to northwest. So he used this section right here, this reach, um, was able to see the, find the high water marks on the mountainsides, like in the picture I showed you, using the gradient, he was then able to calculate, and that's where he came up with the roughly 350 million cubic feet per second. So that was flowing through here. And presumably meeting an ice dam somewhere right in here, but, see, here's the thing. Um, the idea is that there's an ice dam here, and you've got this reservoir of water. The, the, the surface level of this reservoir is at 4,200 feet above sea level. The ice lobe in here has to be at least three to 400 feet higher than that. So let's say half a mile thick, right? Breckenridge was not able to tell us precisely where that, interface occurred and what would have been the geometric profile 
of the Clark Fork sublobe because clearly glacial ice is going to flow and it's not going to create just a sheer cliff unless you had spalling, you know, if you had icebergs spalling off of it, ca calving off of it to use the proper term. Yeah, maybe you could get a shear like that, but the problem is, is you've got 2,000 from the valley floor. If I go right here, you can see down below, let's see, again, there's this, this floor has been inlaid with sediment. So let's go right up in here. There, right there, if you can look at the lower right corner of the screen, you'll see the elevation. So I'm right at about 2,080 feet right here. Right, the high water mark is at four thousand two hundred. So, depending on where exactly water met the ice dam, you can figure that the ice that the water was about two thousand one hundred feet deep. Well, now what you have to do is you have to think about what kind of pressures is that going to impose on glacial ice, and how is it? The question that needs to be asked is how is it that glacial ice is going to be able to be so stable that it doesn't give way long before the water reaches 2,100 feet deep. And then what Brad was mentioning earlier, a couple of things here. It seems that in, in modeling the ice dam, I don't see any reference to the role that Lake Ponderé played. You know, when the ice came down here, presumably to the town of Spokane, what was here? Was this 1,100 foot deep trough here or not? Was there a lake here? When the ice came down, was there a lake similar to the one that's there now? Did the ice, you know, I'm presuming it couldn't have been a lake there because there's no way you could have a lake, a subglacial lake here. Lake Columbia down here that's 1,000 feet deep. And then Lake Missoula up here that is 2,000 feet deep. And how can you have a situation like that without hydraulic complete hydraulic connectivity between all of that water. Is there uh bathymetry surveys of the, of Lake Ponderay? Can we see if there's. Oh, hell yeah. I don't have them handy, but yes, there is because uh, you know, the Navy has been testing like three quarter size Trident submarine models in that oh. deep basin of Lake Ponderay. So are there uh drumlin like forms in the bottom of the lake at all? Good question. I don't know. And also, I'd point out, uh, you know, you were talking about what it, what would be the head pressure on that ice if it if the water was two thousand feet deep, especially if that water is laden with a lot of material, so it's yeah. a lot heavier than actual water. Well, in in the standard model, it's not going to be because it's just going to be a lake that's taken it's fifty years down. to a hundred years to fill up. Yeah. Right, but then it has to drain catastrophically, right? Or is then it, that's the idea is that it, yeah. then the ice gives way and the lake drains catastrophically. Okay, exactly. It's, it's been able to settle out while it's sitting there is the, is the idea. So it's. Yeah. But in okay. that model, the formation of the lake is not catastrophic. Right. Okay. The draining right. of the lake is catastrophic. Yeah. But there are ripple fields that are going the wrong way, right? Not that, ripple fields. There are valley trains right down in here. Oh, Dry I Creek. Think, I must be thinking Let's of see. something else. I do no, I think that, we yeah. were talking about the ripples. We, we were talking about Lake Missoula. There's yeah. ripples in Lake Missoula that, that are going show in the wrong that, direction. The, that the filling of it was catastrophic. Yeah. Well, that was, well, yeah, we were talking about the ripple train at Camas Prairie. Yeah. Yeah. Which was. Are not going in the direction of the outflow. That's, that's, that's the problem, right? That's over here. It's yeah. the catastrophic filling of Lake Missoula, people. That's right. <laughs> Well, Again, I think that makes more sense. Flows, yeah. Yeah. Because here's what's happening. You can see right here by the magnitude of the ripples themselves, notice that the ripple train is diminishing as you go south. Yeah. You see, it's losing energy as you go south. And then you get down here to the to the discharge point out of the basin, and just like a bathtub, you know, the idea is that the draining of this lake like if you put your rubber ducky up here and it's floating in the in the water and the water's draining here, it's going to be floating south. But as it gets towards this point, the discharge point, where it not only does the basin constrict, it also steepens the gradient. Well, what's going to happen to the to the flow velocity? It's going to be increasing. Right. Isn't it? In other words, 
if this is if this rip the point is is in the in the drainage model then this energy is uh increasing as it's moving towards towards the uh the south here and in fact if I, i'm still in google earth so if i go right here we're at three thousand feet above sea level remember high water mark was four thousand two hundred feet so right here water would have been 1200 feet deep at the maximum but then let's go down here to the clark fork river we're 2480 so you've dropped over 500 feet from here to here and then you go up here and you'll see that most of the basin floor is is pretty level across here, and you can well, see the see the ripple train. Now check this out. You can actually see. Look at this. You see, you can see the where these water flows are coming because what they're doing is there's a series of hills. Let's go to. Uh, Here we can see the low area. So these hills would have been just above the high water mark. So you would have had a flow through here. And look, you see this ripple field emanating yeah. Oh, yeah. out of this trough. And then over here, you've got another ripple field emanating from this trough. And the water came from the north. And when it hit this range of hills, it was diverted around those hills. And then as I zoom out over here, this was a spillway out of Camas Prairie Basin, and this is a scour trough lake uh, Okay, right there. And yeah. let's see, we are at 3,584 feet here, so 3,500. So right here, the water, as it poured through here at the maximum, was 700 feet deep. And it flowed to the west, and then all of this, let's see this hummocky stuff. And this, all of, look at this. See all of this? This yep. is all material that was outwashed hmm. in the cutting of this trough. And then all of that flowed into the Clark Fork River Valley. So this whole basin here is just massive amounts of sedimentary infill. Hmm. See, the town is called Plains because you got this big flat delta area. Well, because you had a temporary ponding of water here. So all of this material being washed out of uh, the Rainbow Lake Trench was deposited here. So here's where it flowed into the body of water, and then here's where it settled out on the bottom. And that's why it's, it's more flat here on the bottom. And you could dig into this material, and what you would find is up here the material is much coarser than what's down here on the, the valley floor. It's called uh, Paradise Valley, yeah, and there's a, there's a big hill of sediment there uh before you go through the channel because it had to slow down uh before the water could flow through eddy narrows there and it and it dropped a lot of its load right there uh. right there well Brad, well, i feel like i keep sidetracking stuff i get going over to the ribble field but um yeah i don't know there's it's <laughs> It's hard to, for me, you know, having listened to you explain all this stuff episode after episode to keep the standard model picture in my head. <laughs> so oh. It's like, it doesn't make sense. You know? Well, the, I mean, it's not that the standard model is completely wrong. I think it's just no. wrong in a really critical place. You know, and it and it's and and I think the ice dam whole this whole ice dam scenario. I think the more you scrutinize it, the the it just like Mike uh, just said, it doesn't add up. Right. But here now with the with the Google map, you can see quite clearly. If you look, what happens? You got this water coming from the north down Highway 28, and of course Highway 28 wasn't there then, uh, Kyle. But <laughs> no. <laughs> You see here where it, breach, it breaches these hills, the Marco Hills, and this is a great spot right here because right as you make this curve, there's a pull-off where you can pull off here, and then you look to the south, and you can see this magnificent ripple train stretching away to the south. Um, yeah, we gotta and, go but the highest point in here 
like I said, in here, um, the water rose again to 4,200 feet above sea level. So it was about 1,200 feet deep in the basin. And then you can see that the water drained to the south and then drained through this, through this outlet right here. And once the water dropped, oh, from, from what did I say, 1,400 down to about 700 feet deep, at that point, Rainbow Lake Trench here was abandoned, and it was basically left high and dry. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then the water was words, pooled yeah. here and flowed exclusively out the Highway 382 outlet here. And then, of course, all, then that water met water that was coming around this way. And then together, all that water flowed to the north. Um, here's Eddie Narrows. So, so here's and when we take our uh, part two, which really ought to be part one of the Missoula flood or the Cordilleran floods tours we're going to do, there's a hot spring right there where the Flathead and Clark Fork rivers come together. So that'll be one of our locations that we base out of on that tour. Yeah. Oh, that Are you talking good. about Quinn's Hot Springs? That's the one. Yeah. I love that place. So yeah, yeah. real close trek over to Camas Prairie from there and uh, yeah, lots of, lots of sites nearby. We're going to base, they got a bunch of cabins there. So yeah, hopefully that's going to go down twice next year. Yes. Yeah. Part two <clears> twice. And I love this whole area here around the National Bison Range. To me, there's, I don't know, there's something really exhilarating about this area right in here. When you look off to the east and you see the mountain range, and then it's just, it's just a beautiful landscape with these magnificent vistas. And like the awesome. Mount Jumbo there in Missoula, there's just strand lines all over it. Yeah. Just like on right here. Oh, yeah. Again, you head up to 4,200 feet above sea level. Well, you probably can't see, but Brad's wearing his hat. Yep. Time to wrap oh. it up. Okay. Well, what we're going to pick up with then, okay, so we've kind of honed in because what I want to do is I want to come back and kind of scrutinize in a little more detail this whole ice dam uh, idea. And the question, again, of where do you ultimately get 600 cubic miles of water to fill these lakes? Um, I think I'll quick stop that share and I will just jump over, um, to, to this, to, sh to, cause we're going to be coming Your, back Europe. to Europe. No, we're not ready to go to Europe. Just way a field here. We're trying to wrap up. <laughs> just quickly, uh, jump to the other side of the planet. And, uh, yeah. Quickly. We'll jump to <laughs> Yeah, take a look at Australia here. Uh. <laughs> I was actually thinking we'd spend a few minutes at the South Pole. See, there we go. One of those uh -huh. photos of the one of those photos of the mountaintop was definitely Antarctica. Yeah, so I was going to say the other place to search for those nunataks. Yeah, Antarctica yep. and Greenland for sure. Okay, so um... looks to me like all those floods followed those highways, Randall. It's pretty clear on the map. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> But here is a natural way to, to break up touring this whole flood phenomenon. And this is what we did for, for the, the trip that we just did. We were pretty much focused in this area right here. We wanted to get down to Wallula Gap, which is here. Would have been nice to get up into the Yakima back flooded valley. Would have been nice to get down in here into the Walla Walla and to Tammany Bar and all of this. We didn't get to any of those places. We just didn't have enough time much less to have gone through the gap and then gone down through the gorge and then say there's there's still a lot of we only did um part of uh the um Willamette Valley the very first trip but there's this is a very beautiful place and you know what this was was a huge back flood 400 feet deep that left a lot of really rich alluvial soil on the floor of Willamette Valley and that's why it's such a uh, such a great agricultural place right now. Um, but yeah, so you could actually follow the floodwaters right out here to the Pacific where they discharged at Astoria. But so yeah, we didn't get through any of this. We didn't get into this. 
And then, of course, we didn't get up here to the, into the ice dam. Now, Lake Pend Oreille would be right under this ice lobe here, the, the Purcell Trench Lobe. And we certainly didn't get into any of this over here. Of course, and what I'm getting at is if we really want to get through the whole flood landscapes, we have to go up here into British Columbia and Alberta. But um, so, yeah, we've got to do a re we're going to do a return follow up trip to the Scablands. And then we're going to do another trip where we'll go across the panhandle of Idaho and then into western Montana. That's where Brad was saying at the uh, confluence of the uh, Clark, Flor Clark Fork and Flathead Rivers, we would uh, try to reserve some of those cabins at the hot springs right there, which is right in here, and, and then use that as a base to explore this area. So basically, that's it there. And then I thought where we would pick it up would be We're glacially right dammed lakes and outburst floods. This is what I want to get into talking about, because this is going to take us into the whole question of the efficacy of the ice, the glacier, to serve as a uh, as a you know as a dam that could. Um, and you mentioned the pressures at the toe of the ice dam. I've calculated them, and they would be over nine hundred and fifty pounds per square inch per square inch, right? So that's uh, what's that nine hundred and fifty. Times a hundred and uh, yeah, so you're only looking at about a hundred and forty thousand pounds per square foot. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, is ice really that strong? That's the question I want to pick up. So, what I've done here is I've gone through and I've looked at the architecture of glaciers. I've looked at actual examples of. Out modern outburst floods to see what we could learn from those and extrapolate from that to, um, you know, the scenario that we're talking about here. So that's where we'll pick it up next week. All right. Sounds good. Sounds Excellent. good. Anything to wrap it up with, Brad? News? Reports? Emails? We're back. <laughs> yeah. Back from tours. More tours coming. So that's the big one. Yes. RandallCarlson.com and yeah, sign up for the newsletter and yeah, uh, sign up for the newsletter. Laura's Laura's making more and more posts for us out in social media world. That's right, right. And also remind folks that um, I'm no longer associated with Sacred Geometry International. That's right. And any sales of work based upon uh, any sales of product over there based upon my work is not authorized. So, just want people to be aware of that. That's right. And uh, if you want anything authentic from Randall, it's here. And That's there will right. be more to come on that whole situation over there. So, RandallCarlson.com. Yep. RandallCarlson.com, yes. All, All right, right, guys. guys it was yeah. great Everybody. hanging with you again. Excellent. Yeah. Get, get back in the yep. groove here. Get yeah. back in the groove. Yep. Yeah. More and more info. Yep. Thanks right. again, Randall. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Good night. All right. All right. Ciao. Hi guys. See you, Laura. Good night, Laura. Yeah, we need to put a disclaimer on this one that don't take our snake advice. Because <laughs> we probably just gave people the, the wrong colors. The, the only advice is stay away from all of them. That's, that's right. <laughs> Stick with that.